Well, good morning and welcome to St. Augustine's Church. As you can see, it's wet and it's windy and I'm not at church. I'm in my back garden. But then, church has never been about a building. It's about the people within it. Nevertheless, let's go inside and worship together. So let us worship God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Help us Lord to worship you, to listen to your word and to pray in faith that we might grow in our love for you and for one another. Amen. And we move on to a time of reflection. And let us sit and think about the things we have said that we shouldn't have. Loving God, because you forgive, we are forgiven. Let us spend a moment remembering the things we have done that were wrong. Loving God, because you forgive, we are forgiven.
Let us think now of things that we have not done that we should have done. Loving God, because you forgive, we are forgiven. And now we remember people who have been hurt by us. Loving God, because you forgive, we are forgiven. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. And the Collect for the Day Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask. But through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Psalms number 26 and we read from verse 1 to verse 8. Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered, Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. I do not sit with deceit the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence, and go about your altar, Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house where you live and place where your glory dwells. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from Romans chapter 12. And we start to read at verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not think you are superior. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be be to God. God. The Gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 16 and we start to read at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for you to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward everyone according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God.
Well, as you can see, I have retreated from the wind and the rain outside into the conservatory. My usual place for recording is the office outside, but the rain on the roof is so loud, I don't think I could hear myself and I'm sure you wouldn't be able to hear me either. But I'd like to consider the verses that we've read from Matthew's Gospel for just a few moments. And I would begin by asking what is quite an important question. And that is, how do you respond when you discover apparent inconsistencies in the Bible? Well, that's a challenge that has been faced by Christians throughout the centuries. In early monastic times, the Dominicans followed their belief that scripture revealed an ultimate truth. And therefore they went to great lengths to logically and rationally resolve apparent inconsistencies in that revelation. That is the approach that many churches follow even today. It is based on the belief that there is no inconsistency in the biblical record which cannot be reconciled. And that's a very valid position to take. The Franciscans, however, took a more flexible approach. John Scotus, the 9th century Franciscan theologian, actually suggested that humanity must allow God to break his own rules. In other words, in our terms, to be inconsistent, to be flexible, to respond to each situation on its own merits and with his own terms. Franciscans would argue, for example, that the God of judgment is overruled by the God of love and forgiveness. So to quote Rob Bell, love wins. Well, Matthew chapter 16, as we've heard, presents one of those situations where there is an apparent inconsistency. We have read that Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. However, in chapter 11 of the same gospel, Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So which is it? Is the burden of following Jesus heavy or light? Is it easy or self-denying? Now your immediate response to that situation, that apparent inconsistency, would determine whether you are a potential Dominican or a Franciscan. Is your instinct to resolve the inconsistency or to just live with the apparent contradiction? Well, you may have guessed that my instincts take me towards St Francis. I'm quite comfortable with ambiguity, um, but whatever my inclinations may be, I cannot get away from the significance of self-denial and carrying the cross as a necessity in following Jesus. Two weeks ago, Gaynor reminded us of Peter jumping out of the boat and walking on the water to meet Jesus. Witnessing this, Matthew recounts the disciples acclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. It was a dramatic step forward in their understanding of this man Jesus. Philip Yancey wrote about that incident in his book, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. Great title for a book. The point he makes is that although Peter stepped out of the boat, and that was brave and it was important, before long he was sinking and soon after he was even denying Jesus. Yancey suggests that our faith 
is more than just stepping out of the boat, more than just expressing a belief in Jesus as the Son of God. For it to have lasting impact and substance, we must continue to walk on the water. The cross must not only be picked up, it must be carried. Let me explore that a little bit deeper in the context of our communion service. In taking the bread and wine, we are challenged to gaze upon the crucified Jesus and it softens our heart towards his suffering. That is significant, it is even fundamental. But if it represents only stepping out of the boat, acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God and identifying with his suffering, then are we overestimating its significance? I say that as a question rather than a statement. The Last Supper was not the beginning of the end of Christ's ministry. It was the end of the beginning. The gift of communion was a resource offered to those early Christians to enable them to step out of the boat and to continue stepping out of the boat, but also significantly an acknowledgement that to continue walking on water and to keep their eyes upon Jesus, they needed the power of the Holy Spirit as outpoured at Pentecost. In a sense, communion then is a resource given to us too, but without an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it might, also, it might only be that first step out of the boat. To continue walking on water, to continue keeping our eyes upon Jesus, we need the Holy Spirit. Now I would suggest that during communion we not only identify with the suffering of Christ, but if we identify also with those in our community who are suffering too, and our compassion is aroused towards all who suffer in this world, then we not only step out of the boat, we not only take up the cross, we go forward carrying it. We go forward walking on water. Jesus did not say, think about the bread and wine. He said, eat this bread and wine. Let my suffering and the suffering of the world be part of who you are and how you live. Well, what does that look like? Earlier in the service, we also had a reading from Paul, Paul's letter to the Romans. And in it, he offers some guidelines to what that looks like. He talks about loving one another, about rejoicing in hope, being patient in suffering, contributing to the needs of the saints, showing hospitality to strangers, living in harmony with one another, living peaceably with all, about not being over, about not overcoming evil, apologies, about not being overcome by evil, but overcoming evil with good. Now this is really counterintuitive because instinctively we tend to stay within our own comfort zone where we feel safe and where everything is familiar. But if taking up the cross and following Jesus is a calling to share the suffering which exists in the world, 
if it is to struggle with the puzzle that God allows this to happen and sometimes even uses that suffering in our moments of empathy we have a glimpse of what God suffers eternally without us really understanding how or why being born again has little to do with believing the right things about God beyond the fact that God is love those who agree to love what God loves and to pay the price within themselves these are the followers of Jesus Christ because they carry the cross and they do so because they are empowered and motivated by God's Spirit they are to quote Matthew again the yeast the mustard seed the treasure that God uses to transform the world and bring about the kingdom of heaven here on earth as it is in heaven carrying the cross then is a very dramatic image of what it takes to be usable by God it is not a passport to heaven rather it is a means by which we may share that kingdom of heaven right now and live with hope with wholeness and with healing what could be easier or lighter than that now that leads me back to my original question is the burden of following Jesus heavy or light well that's for us all to think about to act upon and then we'll find out but let me leave you with a bold comment made by Nelson Mandela he says action without vision is only passing time vision without action is merely daydreaming but vision with action can change the world taking up the cross and following Jesus whether it be a heavy burden or whether it be a light burden is vision with action and it can change the world Amen. and now the creed do you believe and trust in God the Father source of all being and life the one for whom we exist we believe and trust in him do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature died for us and rose again we believe and trust in him do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world we believe and trust in him this is the faith of the church this is our faith we believe and trust in one God Father Son and Holy Spirit Amen
Let us pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you hear us when we pray to you in faith. At this time, Lord, we pray especially for the continuing problem with the COVID pandemic. We remember before you the thousands of people mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray for those currently suffering from the COVID disease. We pray for their healing. And those living with long-term consequences, we pray that you would sustain them as they recover. We give thanks and pray for all healthcare professionals, for care workers and other staff working in our hospitals and care homes. And Lord, we're grateful that we live in a country with good health care. And we pray now for those who live in countries with poor health care. We pray that you would be with them. And we give thanks and pray for agencies and charities seeking to bring relief in those countries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for guidance for governments in the face of changing scientific advice. We pray especially for our own government that they would seek to do the best for the people that they represent. We pray for all children and young people returning to school and college at this time. We pray that you would keep them and the staff who work with them safe from COVID. And we pray especially for those who've been upset by unexpected exam results this summer. We pray that you would give them peace and help them to see a way forward in their life. And as school terms start, we pray that you would help teachers and staff to find effective ways to teach children in these new changing circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those whose livelihoods have been affected by the lockdown or the restrictions on movement. For those who've lost their jobs. For those who worry about their businesses. For those who continue to go to work but feel unsafe doing so. Lord, we pray that you would help and support them by the power of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our church at this time. We thank you that we've found new ways of doing things but help us to see how to continue to reach out to the community in our village. We give thanks for our wardens and for Gaynor and Steve and Jean. We pray that as they work to keep church going without a vicar, that you would guide and, and uphold them. And we pray that the right person would be found to lead St Augustine's into the next chapter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would sustain us all through this current period of uncertainty. Keep us safe 
and grant us peace. Help us not to be anxious, but to trust in you. We pray for those known to us who are sick and suffering at this time. And we pray that you would give them your peace and healing. Make them whole by the power of your spirit. Comfort them, encourage them, grant them your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So Lord, keep us running towards the goal before us, that of our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers through the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And now let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, here we are back outside in the wind and the rain 
not quite as bad as when we started, but it's still not very pleasant. Uh, we have some notices, and it is also the opportunity for us to give our thanks to all those that make uh, everything that we do, not just these services, but everything that we do within, during the week and in the community, those that make this possible. I won't name names, we all know who we're talking about. We're really, really eternally grateful for all that you do and continue to do to help us still function out in the community as a church. One important notice relates to the All Age Service next week, where we will do our annual blessing of the bags. So please do be prepared for that at the service. And if you're back at school, bring your bags, have them handy, and that'd be really helpful. Gain is leading that service next week. And I think that's probably all the announcements that we have. Do have in your thoughts, so those of our community who are ill, who are bereaved, and again, we will know the names, uh, but bear them in your thoughts and your prayers. And perhaps particularly this Sunday, give thought to Lucy and to James as they move into their new home in Seaford prior to taking up uh, their position at the church there. It's I believe 16, 17 years since they moved into Barkham. This is a huge wrench for them and the family and a new beginning of a new step in their, their lives and their service to God. So do keep them in your thoughts too. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye-bye.